Hello and welcome to the first installment of the Poet's Voice Reading Series, sponsored by Black Moss Press. My name is Alicia LeBay and I'll be your moderator, moderator for this evening. Today I have with me two wonderful Canadian poets. Elizabeth Zetlin is an award-winning poet and filmmaker. She is the author of five previous poetry collections. She was Owen Sound's inaugural Poet Laureate, co-founder and artistic director of the Words Aloud Spoken Word Festival, and the first recipient of Owen Sound's Outstanding Individual in the Arts Award. She is the co-producer of the climate change documentary Resilience, Transforming Our Community. Her current work focuses on the intersections of nature and human relationships in the face of climate change. Liz lives with her husband in Owen Sound and is a proud mother of two sons and grandmother of two teenagers and a seven-year-old. Welcome, Liz. Thanks, Alicia. And we also have Lisa Shatsky joining us. Lisa has had six books of poetry published, the latest being A Thousand Ways to Kiss the Earth from Black Moss Press. Lisa's poetry has also been published widely across Canada and parts of the United States, and in six chapbooks by Leaf Press, edited by Patrick Lane, along with anthologies across Canada and the US. Lisa has also had prose published in Living Artfully, Reflections from the Far West Coast, as well as in numerous health and psychology magazines across Canada from 2016 to 2018. When she's not writing, Lisa works as a psychotherapist on Bowen Island, BC, Canada, where she lives. She does poetry reading and spoken word performances all over British Columbia, and sometimes in Montreal, Quebec, where she was born. In recent years, Lisa has shared poetry in Reykjavik, Iceland, as well as along the Camino de Santiago in Spain. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. So Lisa and Liz, I want to thank you both for joining me on this beautiful day. Although Lisa, uh, Lisa I'm not sure uh, where you're at, if it's as nice and sunny as it is here in Ontario today. Oh, it's <laughs> foggy, foggy and rainy. For oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're nice and cozy inside in front of your computer. That's good. <laughs> totally, totally, yeah. So I'm going to start the questions off with, uh, with this first one. So while neither of your books mention the current pandemic, I feel that your poems are very relevant to what people are going through today with the pandemic. There is great pain and suffering, but there is also joy in the little moments and hope for the future. What do you think people can take away from your book in light of what's going on today? Who are you asking first? Uh, all right, let, let's go with that. Uh, let's go with Liz first. Okay. Yeah, I really had to think about that, um, mm -hmm. what people might take away, uh, because the poems are, are really deeply personal, mm -hmm. but I think they're also universal. And maybe I could just say a bit about what they're about. And sure. Lisa, you know, chime in anytime. Um, they were written almost 10 years ago, and I put them in a drawer and, and, you know, didn't think they were worthy. So I finally took them out again, thought, okay, maybe. Um, and they trace a year of transition from 12 acres of bush, field, and river, where we had lived for 20 years, to a house in downtown Owen Sound. And, and so I was just tracking that year. So with poems like Packing, The Dump, Prayer for the Real Estate Agent. And I, I was decluttering big time. Um, does that sound familiar now? <laughs> but not just possessions it was really mentally and emotionally and and in the middle of all of that uh, in a long-term marriage we were in couples therapy so i think um, that could be an issue for many people now in, in this pressure cooker of isolation and so one of those poems was a third set of eyes and i also began to meditate and study the Dharma. I'm, I'm constantly beginning to meditate because <laughs> I, I quit so often. And then there are many poems related to that, like ego and stingy and how I'm so stingy with this one moment and so restless to get on to the next. And, um, but, you know, in all the, all the turmoil that was going on for me that year, I found that joy and happiness were creeping in 
Yeah. Hence uh, the title of the book, Prompted by Happiness. So then there's poems like Fully Happy and Happiness Versus Joy and Dancing in the Kitchen. And some of my favorites are what I call the grandma poems. And um, I got a found poem from our seven-year-old granddaughter because I asked her, well, no, she was telling me a dream, I think, about what she, the creation, her creation story. So um, it was just fascinating to me. And, and she said, a T-Rex stamped a large rock into many pieces, and then it, all the dinosaurs went extinct. And a baboon ate the pieces, which were really crystals, and turned into a woman. And that woman had a baby, and the baby had a baby, and so on. And there still are ba baboons, she says. So that poem goes on to explain her whole theory of the universe. And, and then the book ends with um, joyous poems about the birth of our second granddaughter and her dad, my son. Um, so the day that she was born, it was a day of a blue moon. And I wrote about my son. Um, he already has that smitten look that dads get, a softening around the eyes and elbows. And so anyway, to sum up, I think there's probably something imprompted by happiness for everyone who, who is trying to face the moment that we're in now and, and wants to find a path to hope and joy and happiness. And, and I have a whole other part I wanted to say about the process of writing the book, which I think also relates, but maybe, maybe Lisa could say a few things and then I could come back and do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Good. Uh, do you want me to speak to it, the question? Yeah, yeah. please do, please. Um, a Thousand Ways to Kiss the Earth was written in 2019. Uh, all of the poems, except for one. I think one was a year or two before that. Uh, but at the time when I was writing this collection, and increasingly so, I, I find myself immersed in, uh, you know, increasing concern about the planet and sort of that collection specifically looks at the inter interdependence of relationships in our lives. Not just relationships with each other as people, but relationships with our sense of place with other creatures with whom we share the planet, with our sense of time in terms of, are we living here today? Or are we living years in advance? Or are we just blurring through our lives? And so the collection emerged out of my really increasing preoccupation with uh, the world in terms of the natural world and the human world and how they interact. And I started the poem with, uh, with a poem that's called Beyond Words, which, which I won't recite right now, but essentially it talks about like, you know, uh, the message of the poem is we need to go slower, kinder, softer in all that we do, because in a way our survival now depends on it. Like if we, if we overlook the small things in life, those small things, like we say in Quebec, the petit shows font les grandes, which just means like the small things become big things. And so the collection is all about that. It's almost like when the pandemic happened, um, uh, I felt like I was already in some kind of current about uh, wanting to slow down life, wanting to live one moment at a time. I do meditate every day. I, I would say I'm a beginner too, even though I've been doing it for a few decades. Every day is like a, a new beginning and, you know, learning. The more you learn, the more aware you are of how little you know. So, uh, so I felt like in this time of pandemic, if I would say, how does how does the collection A Thousand Ways to Kiss the Earth relate to it? It relates in a way to the interdependence of relationships in our lives. And I feel that this, this problem we're in, this crisis is not isolated. It's not a insular event that just has been plucked out of nowhere. I believe it, while we don't know exactly how it, how it has occurred, I believe it has to do with our relationship to the world, uh, to our frenzy way of living, to our the fastness by which we travel uh, emotionally, psychologically, and physically. And like our, this, this has been like a stop, like we've been forced to stop. We're forced now to, and it's challenging for all of us. And I lost a sister right at the beginning of the pandemic that had nothing to do with the pandemic. It just, 
it just was like out of the blue a week before the world health organization announced we were in a in a in a pandemic so it we've been forced to stop and reconsider how how we are going to live how we're going to still find joy how do we connect to each other in a deeper uh way than before and while i haven't been able yet to even go across the country to montreal where all my family lives to go to my sister's funeral because it was cancelled i do call my dad and mom every day and my other siblings and i haven't seen anybody in a year other than my partner and i and my kids were out here out west but um in a way the contact is richer in some ways it's devastating and there's a richness to it and i believe that the collection a thousand ways to kiss here speaks to that speaks to the possibility of the richness in the environmental crisis of we if we don't start caring in a deeper way for the small things we will find ourselves this is the beginning to me of all kinds of things we're facing as a humanity on this earth that's my short answer i hope i could go on and on oh that so resonates with me lisa what you said and i've only had a chance i just got your book today i just had a chance to read the first poem which is beautiful yeah. and something really resonated with me in, in just the first quick reading um how love and loss walk hand in hand yeah and how through the great losses and the isolation that we have now we are doing things like like just getting back to the basics of what's important and yeah. i've found and, and as a psychotherapist this might resonate with you with with a concussion really i'm like neurodiverse now you could say um i i've i'm not only isolated within the pandemic but within my own head um because yeah. there's so many things that i can i can't write on the computer i shouldn't be doing that i can't zoom with friends or i'm really limited so i've yeah. a friend lent me a typewriter and i'm now going to be working on that or and handwriting and and yeah. it's how we adapt when we have to go back to to what's really important. Yeah. And yeah. relationships, it's all for me, that's all about that with relationship um interrelationships, cross species relationships and and with the earth as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that resonates with me. I mean I I think that um you know, it's like there's some value to how to be here now, how to live here now each moment to the fullest and uh and connect again in in potentially ways that we were not connecting before and we're missing you know it's funny not funny but it's like we're missing things now that we used to take so much for granted like i love going we live in a very tiny community here on bowen island and i love going to the grocery store and you meet everybody by the tomatoes or the bananas or the can the cereals like it it's become the community's quasi uh, community center and uh so that has all changed there's no i have a poem for not for another collection for 221 called the ecstasy of the tomatoes it's like it there used to be such joy in just standing by the tomatoes and you'd meet some neighbor you hadn't seen in a while and then you're having these conversations and the next thing you know half hours pass and you're still in the fruit section or well, we can't do that anymore now going to the stores like a military event you got to get all dressed up and i always feel i, I kind of hold my breath even with the mask on and and really it's just get the f out of there as quickly as possible uh so there's some losses that uh we would that i personally didn't even know would be losses until until this occurred and yet and yet also being an introvert as i would say i lean towards being more introverted there's also a richness that can happen when we begin to settle into a new way of being and uh the travel we're that's beckoning us now is more of an inner travel and i think you know where we are in terms of our humanity and the planet uh the inner travel is definitely needed and and there'll be resistance to it but i just think it's so interesting that this is happening it's despairing and sad but, but there is some possibility of um new new awakening that can come from it yeah i really agree and and I, i'm feeling the same things that you mentioned um yeah. if it, could, could i I wanted to talk a bit about the process of prompted by happiness because that I think it 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 speaks to what you were saying of of the inner travel because I I decided to do write a poem a day for a year 
-hmm. And uh, of course I didn't quite, but um, what I, I um, wanted to do was, was to try to capture morning mind. Okay, that meditative morning mind before you've really gotten into your day and get back into writing again. And, and I think that's maybe things that people are going back into the things that really feed them. Um, and, and, and so for the book, I decided that I was gonna use prompts. So I had two, I used um, a poem a day that I got from the Prairie Home Companion and then I used a Buddhist Dharma teaching from the Tricycle magazine. So I might use one of those or I might use both of those to start the poem each day. And I didn't have any theme. I was just trying to be in that moment and live in that uncertainty of the moment and reflect on the ancient wisdom, be inside other people's poetry and then just see what arises. Yeah. So I, I found some interesting things in the books. Some of the readers have told me that uh, one person is reading a poem a day. So that would take her 51 days. And then somebody else is reading each poem on the day it was written because that's noted at the bottom of the poem. So that would take them a whole year. And then another person read it all in one sitting. So I really love the way people are creating their own kind of reading practice. Yeah. And, and cause I think there's so many ways to, to walk that path of poetry. Yes. Where yeah. we celebrate the struggles and the joys. And especially when we're physically distanced, that's the one thing you really can do, you know, yeah. is yeah. read poetry. And, you know, you know, Wendy Morton, I figure. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And I think she stole this from me, but. <laughs> I, I, we both say poetry is the shortest distance between two hearts. Yeah. So, so you know, that's how another way that you can, you know, get over the isolation is read poetry. And especially, and you're also supporting the great Canadian publishers like Black Moss. Poetry is meditation for me. Absolutely. It's listening. It's just listening. I wake up. And the first thing I do is try and take pen and paper and write by hand scribbling. I don't know if it's a dream or just impressions or a line from a poem I'm working on the day before, but I try and make that the first thing I do every day. Most days it happens unless I get involved in something else, but <laughs> most days. My first drafts always happen in the morning, That's right in the morning, in the morning hours. And then late at night, I kind of, I can't decide if I'm a morning person or a night person because I tend to like the ends of the day early in the morning and very late at night. So my partner will go to bed for me and, and I'll always come like an hour or two later because I like the the darkness and the silence. And same thing in the morning. I love, I love the morning feels like such potential. I seem to need for the poems, the sense of great ab abundant time available. <laughs> I wouldn't say I always use it well, but I, but I do feel ultimately poetry for me is, is a way of listening just a way of listening and standing still in the world yeah yeah and i think of it as a way of paying attention which is the same yeah. thing yeah i guess but also being a visual oh, very older yeah yeah, yeah, Her I, poem. yeah. Does that beautifully. yeah. i'm yeah. very oriented visually too so quite often i combine the word and an Im images too yeah i think that's beautiful you you had mentioned about listening and being present and, and using poetry to do that. Can you, both of you, maybe starting with uh, starting with Liz, uh, read a poem that you feel captures some of these emotions, captures that, that moment in the morning of listening maybe, or, or just paying more attention? Okay, and, and I do ha have a little preamble for that one. <laughs> Um, because you, your, your question when you sent it was, uh, you know, maybe pick a poem that can offer hope for better days to come. And for me, I mean, hope is so complex and it's a really tricky thing. And I've read and researched and written about it a lot. I even had a whole book called The Thing with Feathers, you know, the, uh, Emily Dickinson. And um, so I go back and forth about hope. But right now I'm thinking, um, I, 
this really resonates with me, this quote from Vaclav Havel, you know, the Czech uh, statesman and writer. And he said, um, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing, no matter how it turns out. So people are sitting around maybe waiting for hope. I feel despair. Where's the hope? And just, just forget all that. Just get out and do something. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. as a activist um, in the climate action movement, you know, and directing that climate action a documentary, Resilience, and, and working for the last couple of years, um, creating engagement and action in our community. And we've got now about nine, what we call, cats climate action teams in different municipalities and so things are really coming together here and this is i guess this is i'm reading this one because it's it's kind of a call to action um so what if birds sang only when listened to what mm -hmm. if the chickadee twiddled her wings on the clothesline waiting for an audience or the blue jay stuffed squawks inside his throat until all eyes were on him. Or if the morning dove sang only when a murder of crows appeared. What if we came into this world, tiny lips clamped shut and trembling? What if we didn't cry out when scraped or cut? What if all the hurts and injustices went unvoiced for isn't that what we eventually learn to push them down glance click swipe and turn away like yellow spotted river turtles in the amazon who let butterflies kiss their eyes lick their salty tears we silently weep and momentarily blinded we begin to feel our way back into a cross-species intimacy we have lost or forgotten, to a sensing of sound with the inner ear, feeling the vibrations rising from forest, lake, and river, songbirds, snails, and bees. Hasn't the time come to touch this earth as tenderly as a butterfly kisses a turtle, find a perch, a log, a limb, fill a whole tree with fledging and flocking, yeah. gather and raise our voices no matter who's listening, mm -hmm. because someone always is, because more and more are. Let us let nothing come between our impulse to be heard and the cry, the song, the call that resonates from deep within. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. mm. Very nice. Lisa, if you would please uh, share a poem with us now. Yeah. Um, when I was thinking about that in relation to your question, uh, the poem that came out to me that, that felt like it might answer it a little bit. It's called Small Things. So, so I do know this poem. Let's see if I know it here. <laughs> Sorry. So it's Small Things. Um, survival. Survival means knowing there's more than we know happening right here. There's there's a place that exists. There's a place that exists in between the comings and goings amidst the motion and commotion. There is a place. And in this place, there is silence. And in the silence, there is music. Listen, listen carefully. There are frogs still in the world and they speak in ancient tongues. And sometimes, sometimes you can even understand them. There's a whole world going on inside the one we think we know. If you stand still long enough and watch, look, look in the pavement, there are flowers breaking through. And in the trees, the trees, well, they hold the songs from which the birds fly out. And later, 
later at the grocery store, you're standing there, there's a woman in line with you and suddenly you both laugh. You don't even know anymore what the laughter was about. But it's now, it's now the song you carry into the day and it changes, it changes everything. And you keep on walking and suddenly at a street corner, you see a man sweeping leaves into neat, beautiful piles and a wind suddenly comes around and grabs the leaves and flies them in every direction and the man stops and looks up and you stop and look up too and for a moment your eyes meet and you smile because what else is there to do? What else is there to do when the wind is kissing the leaves, their flight? And you, you catch that image like, like it's a private kiss. You catch this image, a private kiss that you put in your pocket and you carry it through the day. And we carry these private images and kisses in our pocket then and they change us and they enter us and every space we enter enters us too and we carry them and they they carry us too ladies thank you both so much that was beautiful I think that's about all the time we have uh, for this afternoon. So I want to thank you both again for joining me and thank everyone at home who's watching and remind everybody that if they'd like to purchase copies of Lisa or Liz's books, then they can do so on chapters or for, through their local bookseller and we'll some, include some links at the end of this video so that uh, anyone can purchase them. Uh, so thank you so much, ladies. And uh, so much. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.